I'm here with Bill Vales. Last fall, we did a show where Bill introduced us to some of the ge geology in Littleton. The program was so well received that we decided to do more shows on this. And uh, Bill, we talked about the Clinton Newberry Fault and how Littleton started off um, the coast of Africa. And you spoke about some of the more recent Ice Age landforms, and I can bet there's plenty more to tell us. Barbara, thanks for having me back. Uh, there's plenty more to talk about for G Littleton geology. In fact, we only scratched the surface of uh, Littleton's geology. Mm -hmm. I had hoped that I whet the appetites of our viewers, and apparently I did, so here I am again with uh, more things to say and more stuff to show. Good, because so. um, you certainly did get me started. I can't even look at rocks the same anymore, and I, I've always liked them, but now I can see a whole different thing in them. And, um, but I know that you have more to say, too, about exotic terrains and uh, the Clinton Newberry Fault and glacial geology of Littleton. Plenty to say about all of those topics. I thought where we should uh, first start is we should talk about the different types of rocks. We didn't cover that last time, and there's three basic types of rocks. Mm -hmm. There's sedimentary rocks, igneous rocks, and metamorphic rocks, mm -hmm. and we're going to take each of those in turn. Good. S Good. Sedimentary rocks are made from sediment. And I think logically we all have an idea of what sediment is. Mm -hmm. It's uh, particulate matter made from uh, rocks that have been ground down. And of course we all are, are very familiar with um, this type of sediment that we see at the beach, which is simply beach sand. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and this beach sand may have started like from one type of rock. Okay, and uh, there's also other types of sediment, and you'll notice that this type of sand, which came from Virgin Gorda, when my wife and I were on uh, our honeymoon, um, you'll notice that this is light in color, contrasted with this sand that's dark in color. Mm -hmm. So that speaks to where this sediment came from. And you can also see that in this sand, uh, there's shells, and there's skeletons of fish uh. and other small life, and all of that comprises the sediment pile, if you will. Mm -hmm. So as sediment forms, it piles up, stacks up, stacks up, stacks up, and then comes under intense pressure that takes the sediment and turns it into a sedimentary rock. And that process is called lithification. Mm -hmm. It actually compresses that. Mm -hmm. And when something lithifies, we may get a sedimentary rock similar to this, which is limestone. And this is limestone that came from the uh, Grand Canyon region. And you can see in there that there's uh, uh, some skeletons and fossils of various uh, creatures that appeared in, in that sediment. Mm -hmm. Another type of sediment. So one thing though, does that make this particular rock uh, softer or very hard? Great question. Limestone is fairly hard. Okay. Okay, it's a fairly hard mm -hmm. rock. And On the other hand, we have this, which is much softer, and if you take your uh, fingernail, you can you, uh -huh. you can scratch that. Okay. There it is. That came from the White Cliffs of Dover. Okay, and uh, that sediment. And it's really white. <laughs> and it, it, it's really white. Uh, actually, it's white with a uh, with a lot of black inclusions in it, which are flint. That is also part of the, um, uh, the animals, if you will, the single cell animals that made up those deposits. But that is a sedimentary rock too that mm -hmm. had a, a lot of skeletons compress, a lot of shells compress, and o over the uh, millennia it uh, produced. Uh, yeah, and I can see the little, little tiny, tiny black specks in here. Yep. So, and this is quite smooth when it's broken. It absolutely is, yeah. And it can be used for carving. 
Very, very pretty, though. It's beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. Okay, so that's... Um, those are some examples of uh, uh, sedimentary rocks. And, you know, to finish the story about sedimentary rocks, here are some examples of sediments. Uh, and you'll notice that these have fossils in them. Yep. Those are leaf fossils, which would be carbon-based. That's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. There's a trilobite, trilobite which was a, uh, in, the, in ancient oceans. And all of these comprise the sedimentary pile. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they're compressed. And if we're fortunate enough, some fossils will preserve in sediment. Uh, uh, many times a lot don't preserve. But if the uh, conditions are right, you, you will get some too. Yeah, well this one even has nice color. Yes. It picked up, did yeah. it pick it up from the leaf or is it Pro just in that rock? Probably not. It was probably more uh, a function of staining in the rock, perhaps some iron that's in the rock or some uh, uh, minerals that were in solution that, that got into the rocks because mm -hmm. these would have been in stacks, if you will. And, you know, as the layers get exposed and broken apart by man or chemical or weathering, uh, those things get get exposed. <laughs> and here's a uh, classic uh, fossil from Wyoming, which is in sandstone. Okay. okay. And uh, this was in the Green River uh, deposits, probably from uh, I want to say about 50 million years ago. Just loaded with uh, fish skeletons that uh, comprise that sediment pile. Yeah. Perfect, it's there. Yeah, it, it absolutely is there. <clears throat> so those are the types of things that comprise sediments. Mm -hmm. Oh, and a good one that I have to show. This is a limestone, and this is so appropriate in Massachusetts right now, with a shark's tooth in it. Ah! So as sharks there it is. and fish lose their teeth, so that's in limestone. Okay. My goodness. Now, okay, how did you, now did you find this or was this something that you got wherever you went? Some of them, some of these have been purchased, some of these have been found. Mm -hmm. um, I found um, numerous shark teeth in, in the waters. That, that one happened to be purchased. Ah. Um, the, so can you imagine how old that is maybe? You can. You can. Uh, the best way to date that is not so much to date the tooth, but rather to date the surrounding rock. Okay. Okay. And um, that'll be in our third show. Good. <laughs> you know, how we uh, date Think things. about that. There will be a third show because okay. there's more to tell about this, that's for sure. Okay. So those are sediments. Uh -huh. Okay. Sedi sediments that will contribute to making sedimentary rocks. Okay. Second type of uh, major rock group is called igneous rocks. And igneous rocks are produced deep in the, um, um, the balls of the earth, mm -hmm. if you will, mm -hmm. where the rock has become molten. It's in a molten state of magma. And as the heated rock tends to migrate up, right, heat rises as that tends to migrate up, it will tend to cool and it will cool under the surface and produce these large deposits. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's one type of igneous rock. That's called an intrusive igneous rock. Intrusive referring to the fact it's inside the earth. And an intrusive in igneous rock would be granite. Okay, and we all know granite and an example of granite here. Here's a little piece of granite. Oh, yeah. Okay. I didn't bring my big granite bench. <laughs> or a post. Yeah. A lot of posts made out right. of granite. But you can see there's a consistency, <laughs> and there's all different types of granites and rocks because these melts, if you will, are all different. They're all different based on the percentage of the various types of minerals and elements that are migrating in the melt. So everything is, the, the stew is different. 
Uh -huh. Okay, but you can see there the consistency throughout that sample where you have these uh, uh, little black flakes of what they call horn blend and a little bit of uh, speckling of mm -hmm. uh, micas. There's some micas in there. Mm -hmm. And quartz, of course, is, is part of this. Well, one of the things when, you, you know, when we were children, <clears throat> you're always looking for rocks that have micas in it mm -hmm. because they shine and glitter and just look so pretty. Yeah, mica is... Uh, but then again, they fall apart. Once you have them, the micas falls off. And uh, I'm going to show you some great micas. Now, another type of igneous rock is rock, is rock that's produced deep within the earth, and it comes out very quickly, a volcano. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's an igneous rock. Now, when uh, magma gets ejected from a volcano, it may wind up in water, or it certainly winds up on the Earth's surface very mm -hmm. quickly. Mm -hmm. So that means it cools extremely quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay, whereas rock, intrusive rock that remains in the depths of the Earth, it would cool very slowly okay. over millions of years. Yes. Okay. And a sample of, of um, extrusive igneous rock is... Um, Hmm. Look at that. Now, it's, is it black or is it? That's called obsidian. Okay. And uh, it has a black brownish uh, color mm -hmm. to it. And uh, uh, it has really no crystals. If you look at that, there's no crystals or uh, any variation in the shape. It's very, very smooth. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because it cooled extremely quickly. Extremely quickly. What would they use this for? Would they use it for anything? Making, I don't know. It's a uh, prized uh, source for Native Americans. And when I say Native Americans, I mean, the, you know, the very early people mm -hmm. that populated um, uh, the continents to make tools out of. Oh. They could nap that to make various uh, projectile points, cutting tools for skinning animals, things oh, like okay. that. So, so it's a very good uh, uh, rock to work, as some others are. Uh. And there are some other types of rocks that are not very good to work. Mm. So... This almost, uh, I'm looking at it in a whole different way. I'm looking at it artistically and saying, gee, I wonder if it's sliced really thin, does it make a, like a window or is it too thick? Um, you know, something, I see it mm -hmm. um, doing something else. Yeah, well, there's a lot of beautiful uh, and aesthetic uh, aspects um, to rocks as well as minerals. Mm -hmm. No. As I said, there's no such thing as a bad rock. Yeah. So, so that's a, uh, so that's an extrusive igneous yeah. rock. Yeah, I like that one. Okay, and then the third type of rock, major rock group, is the metamorphic rock, and the metamorphic rocks are rocks that have been deformed through heat, pressure stretching, shearing, compression, um, but they haven't quite been melted. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they've, they've uh, entered a viscous state where if you think of, think of molasses, how thick molasses is, okay, the rock will get to that state where it kind of flows. Okay. Okay, it kind of flows. And, that, and that's a metamorphic rock. So with a me metamorphic rock, um, there's a lot of heat and pressure that are, that are applied to that. And the metamorphic rocks retain some of the characteristics of the original rocks. Mm -hmm. okay? So you can look at a metamorphic rock and say, oh, this metamorphic rock was, def was, was derived from an igneous rock. Or this metamorphic rock was def derived from a um, sedimentary rock. Or in many cases, a metamorphic rock is made from another metamorphic rock. Some examples of metamorphic rocks are 
in my bag of tricks here are what's called a phyllite. And I should say about metamorphic rocks that when they're formed, there's varying amounts of heat and pressure that can be applied. Mm -hmm. Okay, that a rock could be compressed a lot at a very deep level within the earth, or it could be compressed more at the surface, so it wouldn't be as hot. Mm -hmm. So there's gradations of, of metamorphism, if you will. And you'll see here in this phyllite, it has a little bit of a sheen to it. Uh huh. Okay, a little bit of a sheen to it, and that's characteristic of a phyllite. And you can see here, there's, can you see where there's some evidence of compression? Yep. That okay. occurred there? Yeah. And that compression has caused the rock to flatten out at an atomic level, if you will, and there's a layering that occurs. So a lot of metamorphic rocks will tend to be very layered. Oh, okay. Very layered in the way they are. So that's what you look for if you see a rock that... It's, cer it's certainly one characteristic. Um, actually, all the rocks, which I should have mentioned, have uh, s similar characteristics in that you look for different textures, you look for different minerals, different colors, different weights or densities, mm -hmm. and all, all of those attributes uh, will you know, help you identify what the uh, rock is, and certainly different crystal forms. If, if you're lucky enough to see a rock with uh, crystals in it. I'm going to ask you a question. Is that rust? That's a little bit of rust. Okay, see, that, you did teach me something last time. That's so I was wanting to know, I wanted to be right because if I would say I didn't learn very well if yeah. I didn't know that was rust, but and that's, that's a, what that is, and I'm going. And rust would have come from iron, and of course there's iron yeah. in a lot of rocks. Yeah. So as water its exposures of iron, it's going to rust. All right. So I should have said, is that iron rather than rust? But close enough. It was close enough. Um, some other metamorphic rocks are schist. OK. And schist is compressed more than phyllite. It tends to be a little bit deeper in the earth. Mm -hmm. And this piece of schist, you can see that has a very glossy sheen to it. And you can also see that it has this layering, this tendency of layering, which is called foliation. But look at what else is on, on the top of that rock, all those little specks. Those specks are garnets. Each one of those is a garnet. Hmm. And the garnet is what's called an index mineral. And when you want to know something about the depth and temperature that a metamorphic rock occurred at, there's certain index minerals that appear. Mm -hmm. And you can pretty much take that to the bank, that if you see a metamorphic rock with, with garnet in it, that tells you the depth and the, uh, heat that that was. Um, Look at that. That is layered. And yep. garnets. Yeah. Now, my last, well, there's never a last. Your largest is it's quite heavy. And that's a piece of um, schist as well. And that schist has what's called starlight in it. And that has some spectacular starlight crystals. You can see all these crystals here. It's just loaded with starlights. So this was found in New Hampshire, in Sugar Hill, New Hampshire. Um, and um, starlight has, is also an index mineral. So that says something about the depth mm -hmm. that 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 starlight um, occurred at. And starlight has the characteristic, although it's not in um, these examples of the crystals, is that it will form a cross. And a cross could be in various ways. That's called twinning. 
Oh. Okay, that the crystals are, are, are um, formed in twins. Okay, and it's always neat to get a twinned crystal. But that's another, that's another uh, metamorphic rock. And it's not our last one. A bigger and heavier. Here's a bigger and heavier metamorphic rock that was found over at the intersection of Route 111 and 495. Oh. Okay, and this is part of the story of the Littleton geology. This is part of the Neshoba terrain. And this is called Nice, <coughs> spelled G-N-E-I-S-S. -S. Okay. And uh, you pronounce it Nice. So this is a nice piece of Nice, <laughs> okay. And um, you'll see here that because of the compressional forces here, that's caused like minerals to migrate into layers, uh, 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 similar layers. Right, you can okay. see Okay, And um, these make beautiful bands or flows, and this is called the banded gneiss. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we have some great uh, pictures of this that, that were taken over at the intersection of one nine, uh, 111 and um, So that's what that is. <clears throat> so those are the three major types of rocks. It's important to note that any rock can become any other type of rock mm -hmm. because there's a dynamic going on within the earth. Okay? Okay. And one of the things that we need to talk about is what that dynamic is. Okay? Okay. And that dynamic is called plate tectonics. And the Earth is actually comprised of seven or eight major plates. And here we see a, a picture of the, of, the, of the plates. And you'll notice here, if we focus in on North America, which we can all identify, mm -hmm. we'll see that the North American plate is, uh, comprises a little bit of Siberia. Okay, it's in brown. Uh -huh. Okay, and we can also see that the plate comprises ocean as well as um, land, mm -hmm. okay? Now, other major plates are, we have the Pacific plate, which is down, right down here, it's in yellow. And the Pacific plate, I think we've probably heard of this, uh, the so-called ring of fire. And that's the ring around the Pacific that tends to have a lot of volcanic activity and a lot of earthquake activity. We've heard in, in uh, recent years numerous um, uh, devastating earthquakes, uh, tsunamis, and volcanoes occurring from uh, South America and Chile. Mm -hmm. Of course, up, up the coast of uh, North America, we have our San Andreas Fault. The Aleutian, the Aleutian Islands hmm. has the record for one of the largest quakes on record, the Easter Sunday quake in the 60s. And of course down, down through Japan, over through the Philippines and around, so everything in yellow. So that's called the Ring of Fire. And that's an incredibly active place from a tectonic perspective. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Other plates that we see are the Eurasian plate. And you can see the boundary of the Eurasian plate goes right down the Atlantic Ocean, right down the center of the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. And look what's in the center of Atlantic Ocean, Iceland, one of the most active places from a volcanic perspective that we've seen. We've seen in the last few years how many, earth, how many uh, volcanoes have erupted there, yeah. causing disruptions in uh, air traffic. Well, this plate boundary runs right down the ocean, and that's called the Mid-Atlantic Rift. Okay. And then there's other plates, the African plate, 
the Indian plate, Arabian plate, and there's numerous other small plates. Mm -hmm. In fact, Littleton was once on a plate, which was an exotic terrain, that, that moved, that originated off the coast of Africa when Africa was on the, um, roughly on what we think of as uh, South America. Uh -huh. And that moved into the prototype of North America that was called Laurentia, but we'll talk about that. So we've had quite a trip. We've had quite a trip. It's interesting to note that a lot of things happen at plate boundaries. Okay, interesting things happen at plate boundaries. And there's three basic type of plate boundaries. If you have two plates, they can separate. That would be one dynamic. Okay. Another dynamic would be plates colliding. And a third dynamic would be plates rubbing. Rubbing. Okay. And let's look at each of these in turn. Here we have a uh, sample of a diverging plate. And if you think of that red line to be uh, the position where Iceland is, okay, okay, we have on the right side of that plate the the Eurasian plate, okay, and that's moving towards Europe. On the left side of that plate we have the North American plate, and that's effectively moving towards North America. Now what's happening at at that plate boundary, at that mid-Atlantic riff, is there's a lot of volcanic activity that's happening below the surface there. Okay. And that volcanic activity is welling up to the surface, to the ocean surface, okay? And as it comes to the ocean surface, it is making new crust, new earth crust. Some is going on the right, some is going on the left. And that's a steady process that keeps on going and has the result of pushing the continents apart. And it's a very measurable distance that they get pushed apart. It's small, it's about a centimeter a year, but you can see over millions of years how... <clears throat> so it's still uh, doing this all of the time? All the time, hmm. all the time, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a diverging plate. Another type of plate is the converging plate. Now the converging plate uh, is similar to what's going on on areas of that ring of fire, okay? Mm -hmm. If you think about the uh, Pacific plate moving towards Japan, if you will. And if, if you think about we're moving towards Japan this way, it's kind of backwards in the diagram. But as, as the plate moves towards Japan, the ocean plate dips below, dips below the land that it encounters. And that dipping below causes the plate to enter various zones. And it enters various zones of heat and pressure. Mm -hmm. The lower that plate goes, the deeper that plate goes, the hotter it gets, the more pressure there is, so you wind up with some volcanic activity. And that's what's being illustrated here. And that's why if you go and look at a map of the Ring of Fire, you'll see that there's volcanoes all around that area. We see them in Japan. We see them on the Aleutian Islands. We see them in the northwest, the Cascade mountains of uh, northwest USA. Mm -hmm. We see them uh, along uh, Chile. Okay. Now the third, and what also needs to be said here is if that plate sticks when it's going down, mm -hmm. it's still trying to move, mm -hmm. still trying to move, building up pressure, building up pressure, boom, earthquake. All right. Okay. okay. So uh, releasing pressure is a good thing to have um, a, a steady release of pressure. Um, and, and there's earthquakes that occur all the time that are in magnitudes of one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. It's when you get the, the big ticket items, you know, the earthquake of six, seven, eight, 
9 that causes a lot of damage. Now the third basic type of plate is the transform plate. And a good sample of a transform plate is, is along the west coast of North America. I did say earlier that uh, this part of North America is part of the Ring of Fire, and in fact it is. However, there's several smaller plates there that are uh, playing into all the motion of North America, and, and um, uh, one of those plates is called the, uh, the Cocos, Cocos Plate, I believe is the name of it. And this is a transform plate, and you see here that it shows the San Andreas Fault North America is moving roughly to the southeast, and the relative motion of the Pacific place is, plate is moving to the northwest. And that rubbing, that sliding of those two plates next to each other, when those plates stick, pressure builds up, pressure builds up, boom, you get, you get those large uh, devastating earthquakes like mm -hmm. San Francisco uh, and Oakland mm -hmm. ha have mm -hmm. seen. So um, we have a fault. We yeah. have our Clinton Newberry fault. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I was wondering about that. I was wondering about Littleton and, um, you know, in relation to how did we get here and what, um, you know, yep. what does that have well, to do? Well, the, the Clinton Newberry fault is an older fault, so it's not active. Okay. Okay. Or at least let's say it's not nearly as active as the San Andreas Fault or the Hayward Fault, which is also in the area of mm -hmm. uh, California. But the Clinton Newberry Fault, it's a real fault. There's there's no question about it, and that that started in the um, uh, Eastern Connecticut. Okay. Okay. And it proceeds up to Newberry, Massachusetts, in an arc. And if you help me with this map that we have. We can show a little diagram of this. Okay, so we're going to start out and, and, and we'll look at this section of the map first. Um, about 420 million years ago, Africa, South America, we're down around the South Pole, okay, indicated here. Mm -hmm. positioned. Okay. And you'll notice on a map that uh, South America nicely fits into Africa and that was something that always got geologists pondering, you know, and had them thinking about have, have things moved, you know. Um, to the west, uh, uh, the, the western side of Africa were these three terrains, okay, denoted by this. And Littleton was on this one terrain, okay? And this terrain is called the Neshova terrain. That's, that's what geologists have, uh, have named it, okay? Mm -hmm. If we fast forward 420 million years, the continents are moving, and they're moving under the power of plate tectonics, subducting plates, converging plates, transform boundaries, and mm -hmm. things are moving. These three pieces of land wound up coming up to the prototype continent of North America and welding themselves there, forming Massachusetts. Now, actually, part of Massachusetts was already there. That's the part inside here. But this terrain here, this, this first ter terrain, the westernmost terrain, that's called the Merrimack terrain. So that came in. Then the Neshoba terrain, that welded itself to the Merrimack terrain. And then the uh, Maguma terrain came in. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, the Avalon terrain is what that's called. And that welded itself to there. And that basically accounts for what we see here on this map uh, of Massachusetts, where the original western western side of Massachusetts was part of the uh, Laurentian terrain, mm -hmm. the prototype continent of North America. Here's the Merrimack terrain. Here's the Neshoba terrain that came in. At the point where the, Nesh where the Neshoba terrain 
welded itself to the, uh, the Merrimack terrain, we have the Clinton Newberry Fault. Then when the Avalon terrain welded itself to the Neshoba terrain, there's another fault here that happens to be called the Bloody Bluff Fault. And at any point where continents, where, where terrains join, there's, there's some activity. And, and these faults uh, throughout their lifetime are more active, less active, mm -hmm. whatnot, because of the plate tectonic um, um, mm -hmm. model. So, we started out off the coast of Africa, and 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 the and and the rocks tell us about about um, about uh, some of those distances that are traveled, and the interesting thing here on this Clinton Newberry Fault, right about here, is Oak Hill. Oh, okay, that's yes. the Oak Hill um, uh, conservation land, and some interesting deposits that we have there. We took a little trip up there the last show to look at those, and quite exciting. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a it's an absolute jewel that that Littleton has, and you know people are free to go up there and mm -hmm. walk around a, a nice system of trails. Um, but one of the rock deposits there is called Tadmuck Brook Schist. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that schist, which I showed you before, this is actually Tadmuck Brook schist, is evidence of, of the depth that this was created at and the fact that this piece of terrain went under the existing Merrimack terrain that was there ahead of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, And there's places on on um, Route 2, where you can see great deposits of this, but a much easier place to see it is on Oak Hill Road. There's some very good deposits. Mm -hmm. And also on the Oak Hill Conservation property, there's uh, huge deposits of this Tadmuck Brook schist. Yeah. And on Lookout Point, which is the highest point in Littleton, it's a little below the highest point in Littleton, which has some spectacular views into uh, Boston, mm -hmm. there's a point of contact up there where you can see where Tadmuck Brook Schist made contact with granite. And you can see uh, the two different rock types next to one another. And um, we, we have some film of that. Yeah. So Littleton shown. actually <clears throat> probably has a lot of um, <clears throat> rocks um, of all types that came from Africa, maybe. They came from all different places. Yeah. Absolutely, all different places. And uh, that story isn't all that unique to places within the world, because everything in the world has been dealing with the plate tectonics model. Mm -hmm. So there's been a, a constant movement of, uh, of the plate boundaries, of the land masses, uh -huh. and of course with the rock cycle you constantly have old rocks being made into new rocks and the soup is changing and uh, it's, a, it's a, constant, uh, yeah. a constant motion. Well, I think that it's, uh, it has gotten so interesting for me, I can't even, all I have to do is listen because I'm so interested in what you have to say about this and uh, thinking of all the places that you've said you can see these rocks or rocks to look for, um, looking at rocks. Uh, it's true, since our last um, show, if I see something different in a rock, you know, I pick it up, I have to look at it. Of course, I don't know what I'm looking for, but at mm -hmm. least I know that I like that and I like yeah hearing about it. Yes. So, and I'm hoping and I'm sure that uh, a lot of people out there are learning a whole lot right now and I hope so. will continue to um, take an interest in geology. That would be yeah. great. Yeah. Well, you want to hear more about the Ice Age? Well, sure, because that's very important um, here in Littleton, too. Cause Absolutely. Uh, the Ice Age is a very prominent event that uh, we in New England uh, see the results of. In fact, the Ice Age 
and, and there's been numerous ice ages in the history of the Earth that uh, go back um, millions and millions of years. But the most recent ice age is known as the Plastocene period. And okay. that's the uh, ice age that we think about with the saber-toothed tigers and the, the woolly mammoths. Um, and the Plastocene Ice Age started roughly 2.5 million years ago. And the last ice is thought to have left about 12,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it probably depends on the area that you're in. There might have been pockets of ice that stayed a little longer. Uh, but it is thought that uh, the ice over areas such as Littleton was more than a mile high. So there was a tremendous amount of water locked up in the ice, which of course meant sea level went down mm -hmm. because that water is now in the ice. And with that ice on land, that would also have the effect of Fresh. really depressing a lot of weight. Uh -huh. So that would really depress uh, uh, the land. Uh -huh. So some... The results of the glacier moving around has hidden and changed a lot of the rocks that we see because the, the, the f action of the ice is a tremendous grinding machine. It's, it's, it's just grinding everything that's below it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's left some uh, incredible formations around if you know what to look at. And uh, the other problem, or it's not really a problem, the other um, uh, fact is all the beautiful vegetation that we have around that grows up the trees, that covers a lot of the rocks. Okay? Uh, yeah. It covers a lot of the landforms, so we really can't see. So we have to um, keep that in mind and try to visualize things uh, without vegetation and also remembering that if an ice age landform occurred 15,000 years ago, it was probably subjected in the last 15,000 years to some erosion, mm -hmm. okay? So it's probably in a different form than it was when it was originally uh, laid down. Mm -hmm. But some of the ones that we talked about last time, just to refresh your memory, we talked about erratic boulders that were dragged around by the ice, and as the ice melts, boom, it drops the boulder. And those just dot our landscape right. all, all through New England. We talked about kettle ponds, kettle holes, kettle lakes, and Long Lake is certainly a, a, a good example of a kettle lake. Mm -hmm. And a famous kettle pond is Walden Pond. Okay, that's, that's a kettle, kettle pond. Yeah. And in um, Cape Cod, all these freshwater lakes uh, are kettle, kettle lakes and kettle holes because that happens to be where the end of the glacier came. The most recent glacier pretty much stopped in the formation of uh, uh, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, Long Island. That was really what's called the terminus or the terminal, mm -hmm. the end point mm -hmm. of, of, the, of the glacier. But um, some other great features that we see in Littleton from the uh, glacier is Tophet's Chasm. Mm -hmm. Okay, which is on the Oak Hill Conservation Land. And if you recall, when we went there, it's a pretty deep chasm. It is. I mean, the chasm today is about 80 feet deep. Mm -hmm. And we could really get a sense of that from standing on one side and looking across to the other. Mm -hmm. you, could, you, could, you could see the depth and see the sharpness of the rise on the other. Throwing on, a rock and seeing how long it takes. To well, trying to, trying to throw a rock. Yeah, trying <laughs> Right. Um, <laughs> Through all the but trees. But when, when, when that was formed, the, the way that was formed was the Nashua River and a lot of our rivers during Ice Age times were actually lakes. So the Nashua River was Lake Nashua. Hmm. The Merrimack River was Lake Merrimack. The Connecticut River was Hitchcock Lake, okay? Because as the ice was melting, it's putting a lot of, a lot of water, okay? True. Fl flooding these areas out. Uh -huh. Well, Tophet's Chasm was formed because there was a ridge of land there that was holding back Lake Nashua. And there was a breach that happened and that breach caused water from Lake Nashua to flow over. 
And that flowing over carved out Tophet's chasm. And Tophet's chasm was thought to be uh, about 110 feet in depth. Um, and when you consider that Niagara Falls is about 140 feet in depth, mm -hmm. um, Tophet's chasm was was pretty impressive. It must have been. Okay, and it carved that a whole chasm. And now it's about 80 feet deep because mm -hmm. it since has filled in, uh, uh, turning into a swamp. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. So, and another uh, great landform that we see around are drumlins. Right. Okay, and these are the rounded hills that, that we see. Famous drumlin, drumlin farms. Why do they call it drumlin farms? It's built on a drumlin. Right. Beacon Hill is a drumlin. Um, some other drumlins are the, well, the Prouty, Prouty, uh, the Prouty Hills at the height of land mm -hmm. is a drumlin. Mm -hmm. Proctor Hill, uh, which is uh, bounds Hartwell Ave and 119, mm -hmm. is a drumlin. And, oh, yeah. and drumlins tend to have the form. You get them? This is a very technical tool that I have, a bird seed scoop. <laughs> but it really illustrates the shape of a drumlin nicely. That a drumlin is an elongated feature. Okay. And what happens is with this with the ice coming from this side, drumlins tend to align in a north south way, north south position. Mm -hmm. Because they're laid down by the glacier. Okay. And if the glacier is tending to come from the north and move to the south, yeah. it would make sense that the drumlins would align themselves in a north-south fashion. Mm -hmm. And a drumlin tends to have a very gradual sloping ridge that comes up like this, and then it drops down, uh, okay. for, forming this shape. And uh, it, it, it's not completely understood our drumlins uh, are formed. It's thought that the ice is carrying a lot of um, uh, a lot of material in it that's mm -hmm. picked up along its journey, rocks and um, things. And if it runs into some bedrock, it'll tend to plaster its its uh, what it's carrying against the bedrock and just sort of ride up in a smooth fashion. Okay. And some well-known uh, uh, drumlins. And drumlins tend to appear in what's called drumlin fields or swarms of drumlin. And if you look in upstate New York using satellite photographs, you'll see hundreds of drumlins. And you really get a, a, a great sense of how many drumlins there are uh, using uh, satellite image, image, mm -hmm. imagery, mm -hmm. which is great for you know, a, lot of, a lot of other uh, uh, geological things as well. Um, and there's a great set of drumlin fields in Groton along 119. All those hills in Groton tend to be drumlins. We'll have to really watch for that now. Yep. We'll really take our time and look at all the different hills and mountains and whatever, just trying to understand where it came from and how long it's been there. So, great. Yep. So what do you think? Well, uh, there's still a lot of geology to talk about. <laughs> Good. Well, this was very, very, very informative. Cool. And um, um, I really feel like I want to pay attention to what you're saying because I, you know, I don't think I'll be able to walk any place now without, you know, imagining what had happened there, what happened there. And um, so I think, yes, I think that um, this is a good piece. The first show was, uh, was very interesting. This is very interesting. And I think that we should uh, continue with, I'm sure there's a lot more that you have. There, there's a lot of information. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I would love to do it. I've really, uh, really enjoyed it. Enjoy talking about it, and, uh, helping people understand it. And um, would remind you, there's no such thing as a bad rock. Right. Well, 
we're going to certainly get together again and we're going to um, have a whole new outlook at what goes on and what had happened in Littleton. How many million years ago? 420, the story started. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that was fun, Bill. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Barbara.